All righty, Taylor, I got to ask, are we around the corner from a recession? Are we in a recession? Are we going to have a rolling recession? Are we going to have a stagflation? What the heck is going on in the U.S. economy in 2024? What say you? Yeah, interesting. So this is the funny thing about economic cycles is they don't work perfectly. They don't repeat themselves. It is very hard to know where you are until you look in the rearview mirror, which is what makes investing so darn hard. Yep. So, um, yeah, I think that the pressures that we're seeing right now are stagflationary pressures. Um, and, you know, different data, cut it different away, you can come up with a different result. Um, and, you know, not to say anyone saying anything else is, is an idiot, but I think what we have right now are inflationary pressures picking up. And I think we have an underlying workforce that although the headline numbers look really, really strong, I think when you yeah. start to peel them apart, they aren't quite as strong. Oh, dude, I, I second that second part. So last month, and again, we get our jobs number Friday, so this will be interesting. I think the last jobs report was 275, blowout number, beat by 20%. But if you scratch that headline number like once, <laughs> it was actually an atrocious number. Yeah. It was not yeah. good. Yeah, it's funny. Again, to, to scratching the number a little bit, one – the level of respondents that came pre-COVID to post-COVID has dropped off a map. So the way they do this, this non-farm payrolls, which is the number that the Fed looks at, which is the number that that's like the all and mighty number, um, what they do is they call businesses and they say, what's going on? And so the number of respondents pre-COVID was at 60%, post-COVID it's at 40%. Businesses just aren't responding to them at this point. And that is indicative of the fact that every single jobs number we get gets revised meaningfully, meaningfully, Meaning. and they've all been revised downward. Yeah, I think it's and like so 10, that's 10 out of the last 12 were down and down significantly, something like that. Yeah, and so here's another interesting point just on, hey, so call it on the rough number, we've averaged 200,000 job gains you know, per Fair. month over the last year, whatever, that's ballpark, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Close but uh, yeah, so when you look at that number, 100% of the job gains that we've had are part-time workers. Exactly. It's, we've actually and, and lost. Can, we've actually lost full time workers. We've lost full time workers, and you can see it because the Fed also measures average work week, and the mm -hmm. average work week has come down. So it, it's just you know, again, if you're just looking at these headline numbers and seeing two hundred thousand gains a month, like it looks great, but then look beneath the surface, and what you see is <laughs> you don't look is, far, man. Oh, no, to your point, one one little minor scratch on the surface, the car yeah, the car's all rust. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it was, and again, I mean, even in the number last last month, two seventy five gains, and then the unemployment rate jumps from three seven to three nine. Right? How how would you tell an average person, hey, we added a bunch of jobs, but unemployment rate went up? That that just messes with your mind. We added with we added a ton of jobs, but more people aren't working. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is nuts. And, and yeah, I think that on the whole, um, the numbers have been really, really strong. I don't know, you know, from the non-farm payrolls, headline numbers have been really, really strong. I don't know what is, a res you know, what results of this, whether you see, listen, this is people saying, hey, we're, we're not laying people off per se. And they are laying people off, right? We see in the headlines. But on the whole, people aren't yeah. meaningfully getting laid off. But the new employees that we're bringing on are all part-time and we don't yeah. want to really commit fully to someone. And are we just hoarding our old workers? In yeah, the that's event what's happening. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exact. Cause again, I, I was an executive and had to make these headcount roles. I, I could tell you the first thing we would do is we'd whack open recs. We'd just close them. You've seen that in job oh. openings. Oh yeah. You've seen that. We get a jolts report Wednesday, I think, or Tuesday, yeah, whatever, Tuesday, Tuesday, tomorrow. Uh, Joel's report and the ADP on Wednesday. And then um, the next thing that would happen is, yeah, we would we would not replace people that left. That would be number two. And yeah, we would hoard. That's I think that's the right word, right? It's like, hey, this is too hard to train people. We got to keep them. We'll just wait 90 days. And we would just kind of freeze. But on the other, at some point, you stop being frozen. And that that's an important inflection point because then, then you whack head counts if you're shrinking. Yeah. Or you invest and you you actually pull Rex forward. So, well, and and think about it though. Think about the time frame we just came out of. So we just yeah. came out of the point where you could not get someone for the job, and so yeah. thus you were paying up for workers. So maybe we bloated our payroll based on paying mm -hmm. people too much, 
Yeah. Changing from one job to the other gave you a $15,000 raise to do the same role. Yeah. And at the end of the day, now we are scared to death. Like, hey, we couldn't get these people. Now let's hang on to them. And then right. is there some, and I'm not making, you know, some huge case for there being this wallow higher in unemployment, but to say, okay, we're paying yeah. people too much. Um, the under, underlying underpinnings, maybe AI comes in and we don't need some of these people, whatever the yeah. reason is. And you start to get a little bit of a gap upward in unemployment. Yeah, my my guess again, having lived this world, is is you can hold on for about two quarters pretty comfortably. After that, unless revenue is growing, you're going to have to make some hard choices. And yeah. I think I, IBM is an example, right? IBM CEO made a call. I think it was two quarters ago that AI did this or that, and then he made a pretty significant cut in marketing and communications, all because of AI, right? Yeah. So there are there are opportunities where bloated organizations with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of headcount could could whack a couple grand. Yeah. And there are certainly out. companies that are growing revenues, right? I mean, case in point, obviously, NVIDIA is blowing <laughs> revenues out. But on the other side of the equation, another magnificent seven name is Apple. Apple hasn't grown revenue in two years. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I guess yeah. That, that's- So let's talk about stagflation. Because again, I, I, again, as somebody who studied economics, stagflation was the boogeyman. Right. When we got through all of this, you know, inflation, recession, all the stuff that we learned in the book, stagflation was always prevented, presented as the boogeyman, because unfortunately, the te the Fed's tools are blunt and kind of single point oriented. Mm -hmm. Stagflation is. Ugly. It, it is ugly. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't seen stagflation in a real meaningful way since the 1970s. Um, and that's why everyone kept comparing last year and continues to compare, hey, look at the 1970s, look at the 1970s. But that's the real last point where we could say there was persistent high inflation and unemployment gapped higher. And so with that, that's the last time frame you can look at. And stagflation is a tough market to invest through. Um, it's not to say that the things need to be that out of whack where inflation needs to go that high like it did in the 1970s. That's totally unlikely. Oh, yeah. You know, oil, oil caused that. We're not oil independent. So that's not going to be that massive pressure that can happen in the short term like that. Um, but at the end of the day, when you have inflation making things more expensive in the market, as you have a slowing of the economy where people get laid off, that's kind of a scary proposition. And so what do people do is like, we're already starting to see a little bit of what people do in those environments. And that's start putting things on plastic. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You're, you're yeah. seeing a, a ballooning of... <laughs> ballooning might be exaggerated, but you're seeing an increased use of credit cards and you're starting to see 90 plus day delinquencies, which is yeah. the scary delinquency start yeah. to pick up. And it has been picking up over the past 18 months. Now it comes from a low level because post COVID, when everyone got the stimulus checks, they paid down all their outstanding delinquencies, but the trajectory is not in a healthy direction. And the interesting thing is, is it doesn't correspond that well with the low unemployment rate. Yeah. Generally, if you have low unemployment, you don't have delinquencies picking up. But right now you have simultaneously pretty darn low unemployment, sub 4%, which is, you know, you know, a couple times in a century that takes place and you have delinquencies mm -hmm. picking up. Yeah. The other thing that we learned in economics was this thing called a rolling recession. And we really haven't had one. They often point at 1991 as the year we had a rolling recession. Um. Part of me just doesn't want to see us go into stagflation because I know that just means years of chop and just yuck. But I do think a rolling recession is becoming more likely. And, and it's specifically because of real estate where I focus, right? Real estate went in hard. Yeah. And it was at depression level numbers. Transactions yeah. fell 40%, this, that, the other thing. It's the most indexed to interest rates part of our economy. But I also think it's fair to say when you look at the numbers, the numbers are getting better. Right, pending home sales were up ten percent month on month. New home sales are coming. Uh, new new homes creators know how to sell. They get they buy down rates to sub six percent. Correct. Um, so I am starting to see signs that this theoretical rolling recession could play out. But maybe I'm too biased given my orientation. No, no, markets adapt. That's the reality of of what we face when something gets put in a bad situation. Free markets react to it and they change their way of doing business to make it improve. And I think that you've seen that in spades. To your point, you know, the builders are now buying down points in the mortgage because they know where the stress points are. And uh, I, I, I totally agree with you on that front that we could just have this kind of 
chop market sideways. And I don't mean it in a bad way. I think you get a, yeah. a washing machine type market out of this where maybe yeah. technology had its recession in maybe. 2023 or in 2022 yeah. rather, right? When it fell off yeah. a cliff, you said, you know, Facebook was down what, 75%, 80%, something like that. And they yeah. built in efficiencies, the year of efficiencies, and they mm -hmm. changed their business model. And so there's certainly the case that that could be playing out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a rolling recession is feeling more likely. Again, I have always thought it was possible. I think about a year ago, I said it was a 5% chance. I think a rolling recession now is up to 30% um, as a possible. And a, what is a rolling recession? It means we never get a negative quarter. That's, that's what yeah. it means. Uh, yeah. But the thing that scares me is just, listen, I'm not in the, in the, in the camp that there could be no soft landing. I think mm. that the soft landing could absolutely take place. Oh, at the this point, that, yeah, it's certainly possible, yeah. The thing that scares me is just the market is acting like there's some sort of certainty that the soft landing yeah, is It certainly to is, yeah. Right? I mean, it's crazy. And, and and the other thing that is like the number one recessionary hist the recessionary indicator throughout history is an inverted yield curve. Yeah. We right yeah. now have the longest time of an yeah. inverted yield curve. Has it been over two years? Taken place. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I think you're right. I think it's been about two years now. So it's the longest time frame that we've ever seen an inversion of the yield curve take place without it writing itself or a correction in, or or a recession ensuing uh, or starting yeah. rather. So um, that's that's a really kind of an inverted yield curve does not make sense. There's no way that you lend someone money for a short period of time and make more, money, more. Yeah, right. Than lending on the long, you know, a longer period of time. It doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, that, that, that yield curve needs to correct itself in one way, shape or form. And historically it comes via a recession. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not in the camp that listen, a recession is not going to take place. Um, it's well, more of a 50, 50 ball. In they are gonna certainly going to happen. The question is when. Co oh, correct. Yeah. 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 We, we, the fed, the fed can't fight off every recession. It, no, it just doesn't. They will happen. happen. They will happen. Correct. And you'll, you'll live through multiple. The question is, when's the next one? And it doesn't mean they need to be bloody like it was in 2008. 2008 was brutal. Yeah, Taylor, where can people find you? You put out daily 60-second content. I have no idea how you get so much in such a little time frame. Where is it? Oh, you're the man. Find us on Instagram and on TikTok. Our handle is at Life Goal Investments. Thank you, buddy.